the hair gel is hair gelling today. So welcome back, or welcome if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the who, what, when, where, why, and how do I feel about classic albums in my collection. If 30 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds here on my channel, over on my Instagram, as well as TikTok. I'm kind of bummed that you guys can't see all of the fringe I have to flap about. So here we are at what is probably my most requested Redux review of this series history. The original episode is objectively one of the weakest episodes of Vinyl Monday. I know I missed this album's 55th anniversary. I was kind of busy that month. In the two years since last evaluating this thing, the show has grown leaps and bounds. Now and only now could I give this record the evaluation it deserves. Buckle up for an amazing journey because this week's album is The Who Tommy. Congrats if you guessed this one. Remember, if you want to play along, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what next week's album is gonna be. I host polls where sometimes you get to pick what's on the show. I make announcements when I'm places that aren't here, like my podcast with a new episode this Friday. You can find all of that on my channel. All right, let's take the plastic off. So I have one of those really annoying pressings of Tommy where sides one and four are on one disc and two and three are on the other. These buggers exist because someone in their infinite wisdom decided to make an automatic turntable. You'd stack the discs up on this spindle, side one would play, then it would drop disc two to play side two. With a player like this, you'd only have to get up once to change the disc as opposed to three times. In theory, this would be more convenient, but in execution, it scratches up your discs pretty bad. That's why I generally avoid copies like this. I inherited this copy of Tommy, so that's just the way it went. Now, I like to show you guys my better looking pressings and jackets on this show, but I just can't do that with Tommy. I've owned this copy for many years. The person who owned it before me owned it for many more years. This thing is starting to look worse for wear. So I'm sorry that this week you don't really get a full picture of this cover art. The Tommy art was designed by Mike McInerney. He played a major role in how Tommy came to be, more on that later. The original Tommy art was just this lattice pattern, but Decca was hell-bent on keeping the Who on their album covers. For better, beans or worse. So a second version was drafted with the guys in the lattice pattern, this is the one I have. This is some of the most elaborate packaging in my whole album collection because instead of it being a gatefold jacket for a double LP, this is a trifold. One might even call this a triptyque, tri meaning triple. This is a three panel design. I saw these a lot in my art history studies. Medieval patrons loved commissioning them for mantelpieces and churches. In fact, a work of art I've mentioned many, many times on this series is a triptyque, Hieronymus Bosch's The Garden of Earthly Delights. I'm not gonna fold this whole thing out for you right now. This jacket is very fragile. I'm just gonna let B-roll Abby handle this. On the outside is a globe, quote, hanging in endless infinite space according to the artist. But on the inside is, quote, the domestic space. Uh, it's a very literal interpretation of outside and inside. As soon as I saw this cover, I thought of Rene Magritte's The False Mirror. I can't help but wonder if Mike had this in mind too. In late 1968, Pete Townsend gave Mike a rough cut of Tommy to listen to for inspiration. As a result, throughout the jacket, we see important iconography from the album, like the shattered mirror. Here's what Mike had to say about the Tommy art. Quote, I like the idea of Tommy the character. Rather than trying to portray him, I wanted to picture his experience of being in a world without conventional senses. I thought it would be limitless and unbounded, yet trapped in an environment made for people who have all of their senses. We see a lot more of Mike's art 
throughout the insert. This serves as a lyric booklet and a libretto. Performing the story of Tommy, we have The Who. That's Pete Townsend on guitar, lead vocals on The Overture, It's a Boy, The Acid Queen, Tommy's Holiday Camp, co-lead on many songs, including Pinball Wizard. He also plays the keys and banjo and serves as principal songwriter. Handling most of the lead vocal duties is Roger Daltrey. Of course, we have John Entwistle on bass and horns. He sings lead on Fiddle About and contributes lots of the harmony vocals. And we have Keith Moon on drums. Tommy was produced by Kit Lambert, engineered by Damon Lyon Shaw. Roll transition. Our story today begins not with Captain Walker not coming home, but with the previous Who LP, The Who Sell Out. I have a whole video linked on that saga, it will be somewhere around here. Of note is the closing track, Rael. Now Captain, listen to my instructions. Return to this spot on Christmas Day. And does this sound familiar? That is right, dear viewer, Pete Townsend was toying with and subsequently retconning what would become Tommy since at least 1967. He'd been playing around with narrative bass suites since 66, see, a quick one. In the Who Sell Out episode, I briefly mentioned Pete encountering the Grateful Dead's chemist while in California and tripping so hard he almost died. This apparently inspired Glow Girl. It's a girl, Mrs. Walker. It's a girl. Also happening in 1967, a bunch of British pop stars get super into Eastern, Eastern spirituality, spirituality, man. See Donovan and the Maharishi, the Beatles and the Maharishi, and Pete and the Mayor Baba. Mike McInerney, see, I told you he was a big part of the story, was a Baba lover. He gave Pete a copy of The God Man. Though the two never met, the Mayor Baba died in 1969, his philosophy just about shattered Pete's world. It seems the book got him to confront some past trauma. Cameron Crowe interviewed Pete for Penthouse Magazine, it's worth Worth noting Cameron was 17 at the time, so he couldn't buy the magazine that his work was in. And this is what Pete had to say about his spirituality. Quote, A lot of people equate finding a spiritual master with discovering the escape clause in life. Actually, it's just the opposite. All that happens is that for the first time in your life, you acknowledge the fact that you've got problems instead of futilely trying to solve them. The problems become more acute, yet somehow less painful. All Baba has done is to get me to start looking outside myself and tempering all my results in his terms rather than my own. Pete visited the HQ in San Francisco in 68, made a pilgrimage to India a little later on. The Baba's lifelong value of silence no doubt influenced Tommy going mute. And the song's amazing journey and I'm free in particular. The Mare Baba is credited in Tommy's liner notes as, quote, Avatar, kind of like Jerry Garcia is credited as spiritual advisor on Surrealistic Pillow. 1968 was a transformative year as a whole for rock and roll, not just spiritually, but creatively too. We're past psychedelia's heyday, bands are getting more ambitious with their bodies of work, see the double album craze of that year. Sounds are getting heavier and grittier, reflecting things just getting darker. America is going through one of their most politically turbulent years to date, the LSD is slowly turning into heroin. Rock shows are getting more and more out of hand, leading to some bands hiring Hell's Angels as security. Surely that won't end in disaster. You'd think the Who would be used to chaos breaking out of their shows by now, seeing as they regularly did that. But an incident at an August 2nd, 1968 gig with the doors shook them. An overzealous fan got hit with a chair. The music will come, okay. Charlie. Okay. Whoa, 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 stop, dude. What are you doing? That's my good chair. The details of the incident have been lost to the sands of time, but we do see the girl backstage with Jim in various documentaries. This incident probably inspired Sally Simpson. Amidst all of this, the Who were at a crossroads. 
Pete said, quote, We'd had a fun pop group career, a string of hits, all of which were wonderful, and suddenly we ran out of songs. <laughs> all around in pop at the time was a lot of psychedelic drugs, a lot of hippie stuff going on, and we know how Pete felt about the hippie stuff. Quote, Dressing up like a lot of cream cakes only earned them dislike. Mind you, he's saying these things while dressing like this. Quote, I felt that if we could achieve anything, if it had a spiritual subtext, it would straddle the world of pop from which we'd come, and this new hippie world that seemed to be about new age values. Not unlike The Who Sell Out, the album with the working title Deaf, Dumb, and Blind Boy started as a series of three-minute singles, but once the guys got to rehearsing it, the story took shape. The September 1968 issue of Rolling Stone magazine published a two-part, 11 page page cover story on Pete, written by notorious clown Jan Wenner. And you guys... This interview is a trip and a half. Pete rambles about sex, the transcendental nature of rock and roll, the beauty of radio. He shouts out Glyn Johns. Good! And breaks down the science of writing a great rock song, crediting John for being the backbone of the band. Pete rambles about England being, and I quote, a piss place for music, describing it as, quote, describing it as, quote, all the bad points of Nazi Germany, all the pompous pride of France, all the old fashioned patriotism of the old order of the empire. This is coming from the man who wore a Union Jack suit. He surprised something as good as the Beatles could come out of such a garbage place, but low-key accuses them of having ghostwriters? I think... I don't know, man. This is Pete Townsend. Nobody knows what he's talking about, least of all him. And he let some plot points for the forthcoming deaf, dumb, and blind boy slip. Tommy's dad just wanted his son to play football. Pull away your dream! And 100% less funny, Tommy was originally supposed to gain sentience while his funny uncle was fiddling about. Wikipedia seems to think Pete spilled the beans of the entire plot in this interview. He does a lot of things in this interview. But not that. But he gave some crucial insight, saying Deaf, Dumb, and Blind Boy would be just as driven by the music as the plot. Quote, The boy is played by the Who, the musical entity. He's represented musically, represented by a theme which we play. Because the boy is deaf, dumb, and blind, he's seeing things basically as vibrations, which we translate as music. That's really what we want to do, create this feeling that when you listen to the music, you can actually become aware of the boy, because we are creating him as we play. Pete also says he wants to do the whole backing track in 15-minute sections. He also says, not even a line later, that he wants to do it all in one shot, quote, whether it lasts for two hours or two days. That is A, unhinged, and B, impossible, as recording technology of the time wouldn't allow that. So you might have noticed that there wasn't a single mention of pinball in all that mess. Because, I sh** you not, when Pete presented a rough draft of the Tommy plot to his New York Times critic friend Nick Cohn and didn't get the glowing reception he'd hoped for, he asked, as a joke. Oh, would you like it if there was pinball in it? Pete knew Nick was a pinball enthusiast, a pinball wizard, if you will. Serious as a heart attack, Nick said yes. He would like it if there was pinball in it. So Pete just made Tommy a world champion pinball player so his album would get a good review. You can't make this sh** up. There is no official plot synopsis of Tommy. All we have are clues from interviews, clarifications in various Who biographies, and context clues in the album itself. I've compiled it all together to the very best of my ability. Ladies and gentlemen, Cretans of Caves! The plot of Tommy. Captain Walker goes off to fight in World War I and almost immediately goes missing in action. His pregnant wife, Mrs. Walker, gives birth to a boy she names Tommy. Presuming her husband dead, Mrs. Walker moves on, but in 1921, Captain Walker shows up all like, Surprise, bitch. 
I bet you thought you'd seen the last of me. He is not dead. A fight breaks out between him and Mrs. Walker's boyfriend and someone dies. Yeah, it's actually not specified on the album who killed who. The 1975 film adaptation has Tommy's stepdad killing his dad. Album purists say the dad killed the stepdad. It's kind of a choose your own adventure thing. Mrs. Walker and whichever man came out alive gaslight this poor toddler so hard that he shuts down completely, going deaf, dumb, and blind. At the very least, Tommy can feel vibrations in music, which gives him incredibly vivid dreams. It also makes him very good at pinball. All the while, Tommy's parents are afraid he'll go to hell because he's deaf and blind? Okay. Tommy is 10 now, and his parents are trying to cure him. They leave him with various questionable babysitters, including his cousin, who literally tortures him. I'm pretty sure he's a future serial killer. A crazy lady who doses him with LSD and takes his virginity and a funny uncle. Finally, Tommy's parents find a proper doctor. He discovers Tommy can, in fact, hear, speak, and see. He's just gone mute from his trauma. Frustrated and feeling as though Tommy's been ignoring her this whole time, Mrs. Walker smashes the mirror Tommy looks into. This shocks him out of his catatonic state. Uh, so the second act is a little less clear, but from what I can tell, Tommy's fans get so lost in the sauce that they see the suddenly cured boy as the literal messiah. As a result, Tommy gets so lost in the sauce of his child star fame that he starts a cult, co-ran by Uncle Ernie, by the way. Some poor fangirl named Sally Simpson gets maimed at one of Tommy's sermons. The pinball cult revolts, try saying that five times fast. And once again, Tommy is alone, but he's at peace, having finally accepted himself after all he's been through. I think. The ending is very vague. Deaf, Dumb, and Blind Boy is slated for a Christmas 1968 release. Needless to say, that did not happen. Pete's Rolling Stone interview was published September 14th. Recording only started four days later. The guys went into sessions not knowing what to expect. Remember, this is only the second time The Who have gone into recording album-based material as opposed to singles-based. Roger blatantly said that, quote, at the time we were doing it, we didn't know whether it would be a hit. We didn't know if it would be anything. We didn't know whether it'd be an album. And it seems the guys severely underestimated how complicated recording this would be. IBC Studios got a hold of a brand spanking new multi-track machine. Machine. Remember, the Brits didn't fully embrace 8-track until 1970. Right about now, in early 1969, George Harrison is having to loan his personal system to the Beatles to record what will become Let It Be. There was lots and lots of overdubbing to be done. Pete would often bring in a half-finished demo and it'd take a whole day of talking and futzing around in the studio to work it out. And I mean a whole day. The guys had the studio booked from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to when it closed at 10. But more often than not, the guys would get caught up in chasing the demo and oh hey! Why are the birds chirping? Oh my god, it's light out! As you can imagine, this was all very expensive. The album was delayed several times as the concept was fleshed out and thus cycled through many working titles. At one point, it was to be called Amazing Journey. I guess Deaf, Dumb, and Blind Boy was a little too on the nose. And Journey into Space? This thing literally has nothing to do with space. As the story expanded, other members contributed songs. Pete handed off writing duties to John for Cousin Kevin and Fiddle About, and Mooney contributed Tommy's Holiday Camp. Meanwhile, Raj is fully committing himself to this thing. He was already changing his look, growing his hair out, letting it go curly, wearing 100% less shirts, and 100% more fringe. The fringe was actually a real really smart move. The guys were rehearsing Tommy as a show as they went along. And once you hit the 75 minute mark of bouncing around on stage like the Who did, you hit the wall. 
no, not that one. Since Long Fringe has a lot of visual interest to it, Raj could just wave his arm and create the illusion of motion. While in reality, he stood still most of the time. You know, except for that. Remember, kids, mics are for singing, not swinging. Raj was editing his singing style as well, perhaps to keep up with the demanding material, perhaps to keep up with Steve Marriott of The Small Faces, and Robert Plant of the hot new Yardbird spin-off series Led Zeppelin. As the guys rehearse Cousin Kevin, Underture, Welcome, and most bafflingly Sensation were dropped from the set list, all of the above have rarely been performed, if at all. Pete starts to agonize over the final product, probably because it was so connected to his personal life. Quote, I was so earnestly trying to avoid writing something autobiographical. All of The Who's first work was about their early audience. I tended to write, if not my own biography, certainly an encapsulated biography assembled from bits of the audience. Yet Tommy felt to me, when I was writing it, to be the exception to that. But after six months of the runaround, the guys put their foot down and effectively tell Pete the album's done. In a 1971 interview for his solo album, Smash Your Head Against the Wall, John said this about the Tommy process, quote, We had to do so many of the tracks again. Because it took so long, we had to keep going back and rejuvenating the numbers that it just started to drive us mad. We were getting brainwashed by the whole thing and I started to hate it. Oh, John. Never one to mince words. When all was said and done, it took another two months to mix everything down, and the track listing of Tommy goes as follows. <laughs> Opening up disc one, we have the overture with It's a Boy, followed by, followed by what my copy has listed as You Didn't Hear It. Streaming services call it 1921. All right, so there are so many track name discrepancies from my copy of the record to standard copies and streaming services. I'm just gonna put them on the screen. Then Amazing Journey and Sparks, and closing out side one is Eyesight to the Blind, a cover of Sonny Boy Williamson. Opening up Side two, we have Christmas, followed by Cousin Kevin, then The Acid Queen, and closing out disc one is Underture. Opening disc two, we have Do You Think It's All Right? and Fiddle About, followed by Pinball Wizard, then There's a Doctor I Found, next Go to the Mirror Boy, then Tommy Can You Hear Me, Smash the Mirror, and closing side three is Sensation. Opening up side four is Miracle Cure, followed by Sally Simpson. Then I'm Free, next Welcome, then Tommy's Holiday Camp, and the album closes with we're not gonna take it, including See Me, Feel Me. There seems to have been some controversy over the exact release date, but according to The Who's official website, Tommy was released May 19th, 1969 in the UK. This thing made waves upon release. While it wasn't the first rock opera, that honor would of course go to the pretty things. It was the first to be a mainstream success. It was also banned by the BBC. Apparently writing an album about the experience of a disabled boy turned messiah was pretty controversial in 1969. Who would have thought? Seeing as the live show was essential to forming the Tommy concept, The Who toured extensively to promote it. The album debuted on May 1st at Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club in London, but audiences were so baffled by what they heard that Pete had to hop on the mic and explain the story. The first American audience to hear an abridged Tommy was at the Grandy Ballroom in Detroit because of f***ing course it was on May 9th. The Who's support act that weekend was a little known Joe Cocker. His big break won't come for another three months. The Who played pretty much the whole of Tommy at four of their most famous gigs, the 1969 and 1970 Isle of Wight Festival festivals, Leeds, and Woodstock. Their Woodstock set was interrupted by Yippie co-founder and one of the Chicago Seven, Abby Hoffman, calling for the release of John Sinclair, because all rock and roll roads lead to Detroit, I guess. In response, Pete clobbered him with his guitar and physically threw him off stage. I think this is a polish while John Sinclair rocks in prison. <laughs> Yeah.
I thought it was common knowledge not to f with the Who. Other singles didn't take, but Pinball Wizard peaked at number 19 the week of the album's release. It remains a classic rock radio staple to this day. Tommy peaked at number four on the album's charts the week of September 19th. Finally, after years of the grind, the Who had taken America. About their runaway success, Raj said, quote, People thought I was Tommy. I used to get called Tommy in the street. Tommy's made a few notable appearances in pop culture history, like Cameron Crowe's semi-autobiographical film, Almost Famous. With the iconic note, listen to Tommy with a candle burning and you will see your entire future. Uh, medley of Amazing Journey and Sparks is included in the soundtrack. It's literally not a medley of Amazing Journey and Sparks. It's just Amazing Journey. There is no Sparks. Why the hell is it billed as Amazing Journey and Sparks? Over the decades, Tommy has been adapted into a ballet, an opera opera, multiple orchestral performances, and a Broadway musical. Pete won a Tony for the original adaptation, but the 2024 revival was largely unfair successful. And then there's the film. <sighs> we, quite literally, do not have the time this week to get into the Mongolian clusterfuck that is 1975 Tommy. It displays utter contempt for the source material. You can tell the Who were so done with Tommy by the time this Tommy rolled around. Tommy is one of the weirdest films I've ever seen. And that's saying a lot. I fell down the post-war surrealism and Japanese art house rabbit holes when I was in art school, living off nothing but coffee, one banana, and enough vodka to take down the lover of the Russian queen. Hell, Tommy the film feels just like that. I can't even fathom how much cocaine went into its production. It's utterly delirious, jam-packed with baffling choices, and beans. I do appreciate the Who Sell Out reference. I was confused, I was exhausted, I was unhappy, but I still had fun? Somehow? I will give credit where credit is due. The cinematography is great. Some of these shots made my skin crawl. The set design is fun, zany, and colorful, leaning into the absurdity of the story. It's unintentionally funny. Untapped meme potential, if you will. See Anne Margaret whipping a stone-faced Raj with her hair, and Pete bitching at John during Eyesight to the Blind. Believe it or not, there are several numbers in the film that clear the album versions. And no, I don't count Elton John's Pinball Wizard, though it is without a doubt the most fun scene to watch. For for example, Fiddle About actually captures the horror of what's happening to Tommy. It's supposed to be goofy, but my stomach dropped when the screen cut to black. Tina Turner performed the hell out of Acid Queen. She was one of the most talented women to ever live. There were a lot of questionable casting choices. She was not one of them. Anne Margaret's singing isn't always quite up to par. These are some very hard songs to sing, but she's MVP as far as acting goes. She was actually nominated for an Oscar for her turn as Mrs. Walker. Clapton's eyesight to the blind actually makes it make sense within the narrative, which is more than the album can say. We're not gonna take it as better here too. And that's just about all I enjoyed about 1975 Tommy. Critical reception of Tommy isn't quite as good as it once was. It seems the 55 years since its release haven't done the story well. It slipped from number 96 to number 190 on Rolling Stone's Greatest Albums of All Time list. But Tommy is remembered as the body of work that outlined exactly what a rock opera is, which Pete would try to elaborate on with the follow-up. And Where the Wall was the album that broke Pink Floyd, Tommy was the album that saved The Who. It ensured them a spot in the next decade where they were to be one of the biggest touring acts of the time, along with The Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, and Pink Floyd. So, what do I think of Tommy? Black 
Going in, immediately after my original Tommy review, I came to the conclusion that starting my Who journey with this was a critical mistake. It was too much, I bit off more than I could chew, I should have given myself at least two weeks to research that episode and absorb the material. Instead, I gave myself a few days. This high concept stuff and a classic case of too much too soon put me off from the Who. Around that time, I saw their Isle of Wight 1970 set. John was a skeleton, or otherwise Phoebe Bridgers. Pete looked like he should be hanging off the back of a garbage truck. Roger was flapping about his fringe so much I thought he'd take flight, and Keith had already taken flight. They're gritty, they're sludgy, they're energetic, they're dynamic, and where have I seen that move before? Seeing these guys in action, I was converted. Isle of Wight Young Man Blues is one of the greatest things I've ever seen. And then there's Tommy. Far more acoustic guitar than electric, trying their hand at the Beach Boys vocal harmonies that Mooney loved so much. And firmly rooted in story, this was a huge departure for The Who. That considered, it's kind of miraculous this was the commercial success that it was. Both The Who sell out and Quadrophenia's subject matter were far more rooted in reality, and both didn't do nearly as well. But through it all, the Who's not-so-secret ingredient was their live show. Point blank, Tommy was just better live, and John agreed. Quote, I only ever played the record twice. I don't think Tommy was all about what was on the record. I think it's on the stage. The message is much stronger on stage than on record. But you can't keep a good band down. As a musical unit, the Who were unstoppable. Take it from the laws of physics. Once the Who take off, it took an outside force to stop them. And even then, Pete might just clobber that outside force with his guitar. I typically do track-by-track track breakdowns as part of my album reviews, but today is a different beast. Not only is this a rock opera, it's a 75-minute one. Not even the Who themselves could touch the whole body of work when they played it live, so hopefully I'm forgiven for skipping around. <laughs> I'm gonna structure this like I would any other regular double album review. I'll point out what I like, what I dislike, and use specific tracks to flesh out those points. Getting this out of the way first, we all know by now how hard I ride for the wall. I've called this thing the greatest rock opera ever written. After this week, I still believe that. Listen. Tommy's got the elements of a successful rock opera, but its Achilles heel is the narrative. The songs can be wordy as hell, clunky even, Pete did a great job with the first act, but every single time the second falls flat. The story is lopsided. We only have five songs of cult leader Tommy, and one of those five songs is Tommy's Holiday Camp, as opposed to 19 of Tommy's Journey to Sentience. The cult leader thing is just a weird turn. It could have made sense. Tommy is naive and doesn't understand how his fame could get out of hand. But the cult leader arc does not feel earned the way Pink's descent into fascism does. The first half of Tommy isn't perfect either. 1921 is so vague that the listener just has to guess who kills who. Quite frankly, I just think Tommy needed more time in the oven. There are about as many Many plot holes as holes on this cover. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Pete Townsend needed somebody to go through this with a red pen and not someone who was gonna suggest pinball. The overture serves its purpose, introducing every major leitmotif we'll hear. See me, feel me, pinball wizard, go to the mirror, the works, but we didn't need all of them. It's about a minute too long by the time we finally hear Pete introduce the story. I don't don't hate Christmas? It's totally bonkers, but Mr. and Mrs. Walker worrying over their son's salvation when there's much bigger problems at hand encapsulates the absurdity of Tommy. That being said, Christmas, too long, Cousin Kevin, too long, Acid Queen, too long, Sparks, too long when you have Amazing Journey and Underture, the pacing issues are real. And literally, why is I Sight to the Blind here? It makes no sense within the narrative. 
Sally Simpson is fun, it's a really great song, but it's just not sonically cohesive. Overall, this thing can feel piecemeal, like the Who sell out without the radio bumpers. Simply put, Pete shot himself in the foot by announcing that Christmas 1968 release date, and re-recording it to death did not help. On to the good of which there is a lot. I stated earlier that Tommy has all the elements of a successful rock opera. What are they? The music enhances the story and all the musicians are skilled enough to pull it off. My favorite thing to track in a rock opera are the leitmotifs, repeating riffs or chords associated with a specific character or feeling. The most important one on Tommy is See Me Feel Me. Though most of the ridiculous action happens in the outside world, each time we hear See Me Feel Me Touch Me Heal Me were grounded again, sucked back into Tommy's inner world. He wants something we all want to be understood. On the flip side, Tommy, Tommy can, you can you hear me? An equally desperate and clumsy attempt to reach out to Tommy, and the pinball wizard riff is exciting every single time. I stand by my point from the original video that pinball wizard is 100% more fun in the context of the record. Don't underestimate what instrumentals can do for a rock opera. On the wall, they represent time skips. On Tommy, they paint a picture of his psyche, just broadly enough for the listener to impart their own vision, but specific enough for us to understand Tommy's emotional intelligence. Ten years old, with thoughts as bold as thoughts can be, he feels everything just like us, maybe even more. Sickness can surely take the mind where minds can't usually go. Underture is one of Tommy's better pieces of music, why it was left off so many set lists is beyond me. Is it a little long? Yeah. But we experience how the Who builds a song. It's the best use of negative space on the album. And I feel every rock opera deserves to have a timpani. The furiously strummed guitar, the white knuckle tense backing vocals. We feel Tommy trying to center himself as he trips balls against his will. Stronger Still is Amazing Journey. It is a little wordy the wizard literally never shows up again. The strength is in the music. The Who could build tension and release to fantastic effect. I don't know what it is, but I feel Mooney was criminally underutilized on Tommy. Thankfully, he gets his time to shine here, launching our amazing journey forward with spontaneous bursts of energy, playful fills, and bombastic rolls and crashes that build the hype. The piano drives it forward, too. Meanwhile, there's a simultaneous backward motion? The backtracked acoustic guitar, at least I think that's what it is, clashes with the rhythm acoustic and drums. Each part of the composition swaps around in an exciting puzzle. It builds and builds until a really unexpected change of energy. Instead of launching forward into a screaming, wailing electric release, we free fall. The guitars howl, the drums sweep and crash as if to draw us into Tommy's inner world. He can't reach out, so he reaches in. John is altogether underutilized on Tommy too. I don't know what it is with these pre-Who's Next albums and just treating the rhythm section like shit. But it's nice to hear him for about 15 seconds at the end of this. You want to see how good a guitarist really is? Unplug his guitar. Hand him an acoustic. Famed as Pete Townsend is for smashing up guitars, he turned the rock opera into a largely acoustic affair, and it's very layered. Sometimes I get to thinking this took the edge off the material, but Pete applies a sense of urgency to the overture and it's a boy. The strumming pattern switching from frenetic to compose, the lead that tumbles away. Us listeners get a sense that something is going to happen, we don't know what it is. Though Sparks gets lost in the shuffle, the guitar creates a nice texture there too. Pete gets all the smoke for writing and composing Tommy, but we don't give Roger nearly enough credit for everything executing it, save for a few numbers, he sings Tommy all the way through, whether that's lead or harmony. In the studio and on stage, Tommy is where Roger came into his own as a frontman. This is some hard stuff to sing. Go to the mirror and we're not gonna take it especially. Grading as Christmas is, I don't know why the laughing is like that, but holy hell do the guys commit to the bit. Roger especially 
especially. He didn't need to go as hard as he did. That's ferocity. That is a signature Roger Daltrey. I get so into this whack-ass song because of him. Pete put a lot of trust in Roger to tell Tommy's story. I think he did a fine job. Speaking of performance, each character has a distinct voice and serves a purpose within the narrative. This works to fantastic effect on one of the most underrated and moving songs on Tommy, Go to the Mirror. The doctor, fascinated by his patient, Tommy, desperate and pleading for human connection. Mrs. Walker, equally relieved that something is going on in her son's head and desperate to know what it is. Dad clumsily asking his son if he can hear him, which is such a realistic dad move. Go to the mirror is awestruck. It soars with the hesitant optimism that yes, Tommy can overcome seemingly impossible obstacles. My favorite lines on the whole damn album are, all hope lies with him and none with me. Imagine though, the shock from isolation when he suddenly can hear and speak and see. Listening to you, I get the music. Gazing at you, I get the heat. Following you, I climb the mountain. I get excited excitement at your feet. Suddenly, everyone sees the massive potential instead of the lack. Smash the Mirror is the climax of the story executed perfectly by Raj. He embraces all the frustration of an exhausted mother at her wit's end. His voice is ragged as he barks, do you hear or fear or do I smash the mirror? Helped along the way by a swaggering instrumental. When she finally snaps and Tommy is shocked back into our world, world, that feels earned. Then we get to enjoy this brand new world with Tommy on Sensation and I'm Free. The impossible is possible. Raj sounds naive, but assumes a newfound confidence. Underdeveloped as the second act is, by the time we get to We're Not Gonna Take It, Raj sings that chorus with equal maturity, fear, and self-assurance. Literally, how do I end this? Not even the Who could properly end Tommy. There's a lazy fade out. Tommy is hard to get into. There are lots of certifiable what the f moments and even more lore. It's a deeply flawed body of work, underdeveloped in some areas, overthought in others. It's no wonder some interpretations have soared while others have floundered. As that sh insane as the story of a deaf, dumb, and blind boy suddenly being cured and assuming leadership of a pinball-playing cult is. It's rooted in a universal human experience. As Pete has said, we all have our see-me, feel-me, touch-me, heal-me moments. If you peel all the extraneous sh back, Tommy is the story of a young disabled boy who achieves self-actualization by embracing himself, not not curing himself of his disability or masking it. Doesn't handle it the best, but the bones are there. Tommy covers topics like abuse, neglect, trauma, fame. No one else captured the nuances of those, let alone touched them at the time. This has both stood the test of time and aged like milk. I don't think I'll ever understand how that's possible. And while I do recognize that very little of this music holds up outside the context of the record, the stuff that is, is deeply moving and executed very well. Tommy, I don't know how to feel about you, but I do respect you. My personal favorites off this one are Amazing Journey, Underture, Pinball Wizard, Go to the Mirror, Sensation, and I'm Free. Remember, if you want to keep up with all of the favorites from all the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. Ooh, and that's Tommy! I'm sorry I couldn't get to the film today, but this does leave the door open for a possible joint Tommy and the Wall film review. What do you think of Tommy? What do you think of The Who? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums that I love. And remember, despite what some guy on the internet has to say, your opinion matters. If you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11, and a new episode of my podcast goes up every other Friday. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye!